Greetings, salutations, and welcome to the second part of my interview series with William Russell Paxson. This is part two of three. The first part is already up on my channel, and part three will be out relatively soon. So thank you very much for joining us once again. That was one of the best duties uh, that I had. Uh, but, uh, you know, beginning uh, as the war went on, then you were beginning to pick up pilots returning from the, from the war yeah. uh, that uh, had experiences in the war. Uh, and I was uh, booted or a captain took over my my position, so then I went back to uh, basically the job was jumping troops, uh, and uh, that was the paratroopers yeah. and cargo work and uh, whatever uh, whatever come up, and uh, then it was after that why uh, uh, the war come to an end, and uh, you had the occupation forces. And at that time, I loved what I was doing. And you know, I, was, I wasn't thinking about getting out of the service. I was thinking, you know, just staying in. And uh, so uh, I signed up with a buddy of mine to go over to Japan, mm -hmm. and was over there for two years. Now, out of that whole experience, I really, really kicked myself because I didn't learn the language. Because uh, mm -hmm. uh, I could pick up, uh, uh, pick it up pretty fast because it's kind of guttural, very strong. It Japanese? Yeah. It isn't, uh, what do I say? It's Delicate. flowing like yeah. Spanish or... French, French mm. is is uh, one language just goes flying <laughs> through my head, and I tell you, I can't distinguish uh, anything in the way of a word. So you know, without too much trouble, and then I had uh, while I was in Japan in two years, uh, I was assigned a, a, a an extra position of being the fire marshal. Hmm. on the base, and so I have, was in charge of the, the fire uh, equipment and uh, along with my flying duties. And uh, so... Where did you, uh, where, where was that in Japan? Japan. Where? Sendai. Sendai, Is, is Japan. that on the mainland or is yeah, it... Yeah, that's on the mainland. It's about halfway f between... Uh, the northern tip of the island, and uh, and Tokyo. Okay. Oh, okay. So it's sitting up here uh, on uh, Sendai. Is that near Kobe? Yeah. I'm not that familiar yeah. with Japanese and geography. Actually, that was a big, uh, right there in Sendai, was a big airborne school. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason that we were there is uh, American or providing uh, the oh. flight for the airborne. That was that was American jumping. Airborne, yeah. right? Yeah. Right, and uh, huh. it was a it was an airport that uh, uh, the Japanese that we took over. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that was. Uh, uh, yeah, some some of the guys that I went to school with back in the fifties, I know yeah. at least one of them went to Japan and he became airborne. So they must have still worked that uh, in the nineteen fifties. Oh, probably yeah. very yeah. So that would be like yeah. ten years after. Yeah, because mm. I uh, I stayed in the service till forty eight. Okay. And uh, so that was probably still yeah. The, what was it? That airborne group. You know, well, I, I, I remember. Just, uh, doesn't, uh, uh, huh. You know, I remember the guy coming back with a screaming eagle patch somewhere. Yeah. You know, whether it was on the arm or so. You know. Yeah, but uh, I know it. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, uh, 
to uh, be. Now, some of the pilots, now we had, you know, some of the pilots actually went to the, well, right there at the school where they're learning how to be airborne. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of, five of the pilots that I know of uh, went to the school <laughs> too while they were there. And they actually presented them with the, the airborne wings. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but you know, uh, I wish, and I still do this day, wish I'd have joined them. But I had a terrific fear of not so much the jump as my, how would I handle it if I froze at that door and just wouldn't mm. let loose. <laughs> and I just, that just meant too much to me. I yeah, just that, couldn't. That can happen. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't handle uh, the, the ridicule that I'd get uh, if I froze at that door. And, uh, but I would just, so, well, that I, was I think what, they helped you a little bit, didn't they? Yeah, no, well they, I know they have a, the, uh, uh, I know I heard two stories. Uh, one, one of them was uh, this, uh, to get the uh, jump master, to get him, uh, uh, you know, to, what would you say, to get even with him? Mm -hmm. as he was going As he was going out the door, he handled the jump master, a duplicate of the the tie up oh. on their their belt, see, oh. and then he went out the door. Well, of course, you know the poor jump master, it, it's happening too fast, yeah. and he just went crazy trying to brace himself for that shock yeah. before he realized that. Uh, so that happened? was phony, yeah. Yeah, that it was phony. But anyway, that was one. And then I've heard their their policy was you say when you jump up one thousand, up two thousand, up three thousand, and if your shoot hasn't uh, ballooned by that time, uh, then you're supposed to pull your the reserve. Cord. Yeah. yeah. Well, this. From the, on the CG, I mean on the, the uh, uh, DC-3, mm -hmm. uh, when you're, the plane is on an angle, it's a tricycle landing. Yes. There. Then at the back end, it's level. Mm -hmm. So you you got it like this, and there's a step here. And uh, I remember... Uh, <laughs> What one can, because you know, when their whole group, the whole line is jumping out, uh, the first guy is going, but as the, the, the guys behind are suffering, the last guy that comes there, he's almost level when he goes out the door. It, it was interesting. But this, one, of the, one of these guys missed the door, and he went back on in that on that step part <laughs> and yelled there up one down up two down up two and pulled the ripcord right and he's still in the plane <laughs> oh no <laughs> but uh oh things like that <clears throat> nobody's hurt oh that's good so and you can laugh about them but uh <clears throat> then after uh after the war, why, uh, uh, I just, oh, I know what the, uh, while well, I was in Japan, and this is the only time that I kissed myself possibly goodbye. And that was, uh, we had, we won't go into why or whatever, but uh, we were, flying over some used DC-3s mm -hmm. to give to China. 
That would be the Kai Shek. Chiang Kai Shek, yeah. Yeah, at that point in time. And uh, so we were all flying the C 46 now. Mm -hmm. So we didn't need those DC 3s. And, yeah. and so I was picked to fly one of them along with, with a co pilot. And uh, the, uh, I don't remember how many, but there were quite a few of us. Uh, the planes, and we were loaded down with equipment that went with the planes. Like and you field. left the planes there? Yeah, and uh, the idea was just to fly them over to China. And uh, we all didn't think anything about it. It was just an exciting trip. But about halfway over, uh, the uh, and you've got nothing but but water because you can't see the land on no. either side. And uh, so you're sitting out there just flying over water and suddenly my, both of my motors started missing. And uh, the, uh, I was couldn't maintain my altitude with that load. No. Mm -hmm. And so I called the, the lead plane to let them know I got a problem. And expecting them, they have the engineer was with the colonel in that home, in the lead plane, and uh, expect to hear something from telling them what my problem was. And uh, all this time... You're we're, going down, right? We're going down, you know. And uh, we had no flotation equipment with us, which... Uh, that colonel, if mm -hmm. I'd have gone down, I think that colonel would probably have would have Marshall. been really, uh, really uh, in trouble. Yeah. In trouble, basically, for have not seeing through that. Yeah, because flying over water, even yeah. even as a private pilot, yeah, you got to have something. Something. Well, and then the planes were loaded down anyway, and I'd reached a point, although I didn't know. How we'd ever manage it, but some of that stuff was very heavy to, to jump it out because the DC 3 would fly on one engine, hmm. but of course both engines are missing and it wasn't, uh, it was just we're coming down. And so it finally reached a point I had to start doing something, and uh, I found what the problem was. And it's something that, that uh, but I changed all the gas tanks, thinking the first reaction was, it's bad gasoline mm -hmm. in uh, a couple of the tanks. But boy, all of them were the same. And uh, so then I, uh, those, those planes were designed with two things on the throttle, was, uh, uh, an automatic mixture control or a manual mixture control. And uh, so I uh, just reached over and, and took it out of the uh, automatic. automatic mixture control and then put it into the manual. And it was, of course, I lost then the economy of uh, the uh, lower mixture in the automatic uh, position, but boy, suddenly, <laughs> those, those motors smoothed out, <laughs> and then we flew it on in to China, and we landed in Shanghai. Hmm. And so we were there about two two days, mm -hmm. and we uh, we come back. How did they but, get you back? Uh, one, they had one plane that would bring take everybody some, back. Yeah, that would come back. And uh, the uh, anyway, it was a <laughs> it was an experience. But that and basically, my time I was just no hero. There was I never had the opportunity or the occasion to be a hero. Uh, all of my assignments were. Nice and safe here in the, in the uh, in this country. Yeah, but it's uh, all important work. Yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, 
except uh, like I said, the only, that's the only time that I really, uh, you know, really possibly would, could have, yeah, could have uh, bought you lunch. Yeah, I could have uh, gone in, but uh, it's a hell of a story, Russ. I mean, yeah. all together though, you yeah, know, it's really right. cool. Well, <laughs> it was, but uh, anyway, I was a, a rank behind, and so I had just uh, had reached a point where I was beginning to receive uh, positions of responsibility, mm -hmm. like a, a flight would fly uh, uh, some of the planes up to Hokkaido. Uh, the northern island of Japan, mm -hmm. and uh, that that's a beautiful area up there because it's a different type of farming. Did they, they have they, snow up there? I think. Oh yeah, <laughs> lots of snow, but uh, the uh, it's like a, it's like you call it you'd call it a a midwestern farm with a silo and a barn. Mm -hmm. And oh, cows wow. and yeah, yeah. and pigs and chickens are huh. running around. It was a different type than in the main island, which is my major is rice. Oh. Uh, that uh, is the uh, thing. Yeah, the but, major food supply. Yeah, yeah. so oh, growing. Uh, I used to enjoy and kind of. Then also, that was a. Uh, uh, the start of at that point in time where, you know, you no longer depended on the quadrant mm -hmm. and the signals oh. of the A and the N. Now they've got you on radar uh, mm -hmm. and uh, some guy sitting behind uh, in front of a, uh, a dial and uh, can talk you in. And Hokkaido had one of those. I see. And uh, so every time I had an opportunity to, to fly up there, I always call them in and tell them uh, to uh, pick me up and... and Guide you in. Yeah, because I'm flying blind. Yeah. And <laughs> so uh, they put a hood over uh, so I can't uh, see anything but my But the instrument. instruments, yeah. Wow. And uh, then you're sitting there... Listening to a guy on the telephone says you're five foot above your guideline. So you don't have to. Ten foot. Yeah. Or you're ten, a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left. So you don't and look at the lights, you know, the landing lights? Then? No, no. Just, well, you go green or red. You know? Yeah, you just sit there and you're listening to this guy talking you in. And oh, then I, I'd have the. the Co pilot and take the <coughs> wheel, and you look out, and you're right on top of the numbers <laughs> at the airport. If you cut the throttle, you just hit. That's and, that's the perfect landing on the numbers, oh, right? right? Yeah, <laughs> it just was amazing. And I always, uh, although every chance I got, wherever I was on the uh, visiting or where there was one, uh, the uh, link trainers that, uh, you know, would, you're practicing your blind flying mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. uh, combing in on a, on an area. Uh, and I I really felt comfortable uh, on, under the hood. blind yeah. flying, under the hood. Yeah, but why did, why did they make you do that? Um, uh, oh, they know. didn't make me. I volunteered. Oh, okay. Yeah, although uh, because I... Who knew? I just every chance I had, or uh, you and it paid off. Like I said, I just felt relaxed mm -hmm. under the hood. You can't see any, just your instruments, mm -hmm. and uh, it's amazing. Uh, this thing called vertigo, where you can be looking at, be freezing on one instrument, and I know. This uh, this happened when I was flying uh, in training, in uh, advanced training, and uh, the uh, I think it was called an AT-17. I know 
It's not the B-17, mm-hmm. but the AT-17. I think it was a 20 to trainer. Mm-hmm. That was uh, the training we would get before I get the B-25 and then the A-20. But uh, the, uh, and that was a graduating plane that I was uh, flying. And uh, the, uh, I know to instrument practice, uh, they had a hood that the pilot and the co-pilot would be your eyes. Hmm. And uh, then you go up and fly. And uh, I had this uh, one student along with myself, I'm a student too, uh, and I'm just watching out for him. Uh, suddenly, the plane just starts going in a circle. And uh, I could wake it up or shake it, but I just wondered if I figured what had happened was he was in a state of vertigo, froze on one instrument that's telling him something. And uh, so I just let him go, you know, and we just were right down to the, to the bushes before I finally took over. And he would have thrown us right into the ground. Mm-hmm. It was hard to believe that that could happen. Yeah, it's, um, I think something like that happened to my flight instructor. He uh, was, uh, he had a student who was a, uh, um, a, a, a priest. Yeah. And something happened to him. He flew him into the, the hills of the, uh, I mean, into a mountain in, Ch- in Chino, right uh, off of Chino oh, Airport. Uh-huh. And uh, messed him up so bad that he died, you know. Oh, okay. But something similar must have happened that the, the guy, yeah. because he, we had heard what had happened is that the student froze on the controls. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So it, that made me very conscious. Of wow. That. But the wow, possibility, yeah. yeah. Now, you know, they mind, held, they the held him back. I would hope. He, yeah. He didn't graduate. Oh, okay. So they held him back. And yeah, yeah. Now, whether maybe they washed him out uh, or maybe he was able to prove that he could wow. still do so, it. So, uh, Russ, so did you have better than 2020 eyesight? Yeah. Yeah. And, 2020 and one and and uh, the other one the other eye is a little bit stronger yeah so uh, the, i had a friend that uh, that when we were kids yeah you know he would say oh look at this airplane i couldn't see it you know but he saw, saw this airplane <laughs> up and up. yeah <laughs> yeah i thought that was amazing yeah okay. so i had to wear uh glasses mm-hmm. when i got older uh, oh, when I was younger, I never knew it. Right, right. But then when I begin to get older, why well, then that begins to show up. So I have a little correction in one eye to balance them out. Yeah, rarely does the same. The eyes are the same. You know that's, that that. Yeah. You know, a lot of times they're different. Yeah. By the way, they still uh, teach that uh, quadrant radio quadrant thing. Yeah. Uh, I went through uh, ground school. Oh. I want to say six years ago, uh-huh. and uh, yeah, they were still teaching us how to do that. Oh, you know, good. The radio. Oh, good. Well, it's always a, a, a good thing to know. Yeah. And you know, it. Uh, like I said, I did it uh, enough times that I felt very comfortable, and I could pick out uh, uh, my. Uh, in fact, I failed. I never will forget it. I couldn't believe it. Uh, I uh, I recognized my position on that on that uh, uh, quadrant of where I was flying and what I was doing, uh, and I pinpointed myself mentally just exactly where that plane was in relationship to the station and whatnot. And actually, I made a shortcut and went through the whole process to, to uh, make a, a landing. And I failed, I failed the inspector uh, 
that I had filmed me, he says, you know, I don't know whether you're that good or not. He says, because you didn't follow any of the, <laughs> the protocol, huh? protocol on, on just what you should be doing. And uh, so, uh, and I thought I was a smart ass for being, being so quick. <laughs> and so I figured he'd just sign that off and I'd be on my way. But boy, he was a, he gave me an eye opener. Yeah, and uh, that was uh, <laughs> that was the same thing, you know. It's interesting. I tried to uh, once I had gotten through uh, the flying on that uh, school CP3 uh, civilian pilot training that was through the schools, and uh, where I learned how to fly. But as soon as I did that, then I went to the Navy to get into the uh, naval aviation. And uh, it was, uh, it, I used this expression, you know, smart ass, uh, and that's about what it, what it was. I'm a young kid, uh, and uh, there were four of us that went over to apply to get into the I'm the only one out of the four that passed the physical and the mental and was sent up or was okay to return for for a instruction an interview yeah. Yeah. And, or uh, interview okay yeah or, uh, anyway i uh, I went into that interview with these striped officers and uh, they had all, quite a few stripes, and uh, you know, chewing gum. <laughs> Smart ass, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, you know, God, the Navy couldn't do without me. Uh, I was, <laughs> I, I was going to save the world, and uh, man, it didn't take those guys long at all to, to we can't use you, and. Uh, Boy, was that an eye opener! Wow. Oh man, that was my first real, real lesson. So uh, I just uh, overconfident. And, yeah, yeah, just uh, totally. Uh, and so when I went to the, applied to the to the Army Air Force, why, uh, man, that was a different approach altogether. I'll tell you, and. Uh, there wasn't any problems whatsoever about picking me up. But it was interesting. Uh, the Navy, uh, I know I had one of those four that eventually got into the Naval Air Force, mm -hmm. but uh, they uh, went to the primary first part and uh, then they sent him back through again to see if, uh, you know, it could approve. Whereas the Army would, uh, you were out and... Uh, That's it, huh? That was it. There was no yeah. chance. There was no chance of trying to correct something or something. So did, did, uh, did, of course, the Navy, did they have carriers already at that time to land on uh, and oh, take yeah. off? yeah, right, yeah. We've so, had carriers since World War One, nearly. Yeah. Okay. No, I just don't know that much oh. about it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, anyway, that would that would be interesting to to land on a on a carrier. Carrier. Yeah. Because yeah. there's a lot of things. That if the water's smooth and that carrier just going, but that carrier is going up like this, and you're coming down. And, uh, of course, those planes were specially built to handle the shock. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Army planes, why, uh, they weren't built to... Not to land on planes. Uh, yeah. I mean, to, on uh, ships, yeah, flat tops, yeah. You're supposed to make <coughs> a, a squealing, sneaky... You come in and just touch those wheels and they, they, they're spinning... 
before they really hit the ground. Uh, so you never know you're on the ground. No, you don't slam it. Yeah. Yeah, what do we call it? We had a term for it, but uh, the, uh, anyway, uh, well, is there any other questions? I can I, yeah, I do actually have a couple. Um, yeah. This is mildly off topic, but since we're talking about carrier landings. Yeah. Uh, did you ever uh, hear or get to? Uh, did you ever hear about the uh, the aircraft carriers they had in the sky? The the, the U.S. Navy in the twenties yeah had uh, zeppelins that were aircraft carriers. Oh, I was just wondering if you had heard about them. No, uh-uh. uh, they both crashed off our coast in storms. Yeah, but right. Um, yeah, I know it was interesting. Um, you know, all of the uh, people that I run across, especially in getting starting and, you know, the applications and whatnot. And uh, I met the one guy that was, you know, trying to get into the services, uh, pilot, but he wanted to fly, fly a Zeppelin. Huh. That was his goal. Not an airplane, <laughs> but... Uh, and that really surprised me. Yeah, yeah what an yeah. unusual thing to want to fly. Yeah, so, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, I know I'd have, who knows where I'd have ended up if I'd have stayed with that 820. Wow. Thank you very much for joining us today on the Krieger Cast. We hope you enjoyed the stories of William Russell Paxson. To hear the final part in his tale, as well as... An upcoming tour of the California Gold Country. Please subscribe. I hope to have those both up relatively quickly. Thank you very much, and until next time, see you out there.